Yeah. Perfect. So um, the topic is really the, the remote sensing and its application for some of the geohazards uh, that uh, impact us in monitoring and monitoring. So just to put it, so Earth is uh, changing. So that changes happen at uh, different scales, uh, global, and they are causing uh, significant, uh, you know, uh, socioeconomic impact and uh, loss of lives and properties. So probably the best way to monitor these uh, hazards at the global scales, um, high resolution and the low cost is using remote sensing. And there has been plenty of uh, remote sensing uh, satellites uh, launched over the past several decades. Among those, I'm going to focus on radar technology, which is an active imaging technique. Some of you are fairly familiar with that. So the, the radar technology uses microwave waves that propagate into the atmosphere and uh, reach the ground surface. And by collecting the back scattering, it tells you something about the changes that happens at and near the surface. <clears throat> for example, can be used for monitoring geohazard as you see here, and also mapping uh, you know, uh, icebergs to improve the safety of the maritime and many, many other, uh, other applications. So, the journey started really three decades ago as the way that we know it. So the, the radar satellites go back to 60s uh, with the SIR mission, but those that's uh, widely used in geophysical application go back to the beginning of 1990s uh, and where, when the ARS satellites launched by European Space Agency. So here you see the uh, set of all satellites that's operated by uh, um, you know, agencies provided public data for the past three decades. Majority, majority of them are decommissioned, but among those, Sentinel-1 A and B is uh, the most active one currently and produces a significant amount of data that is publicly available to everyone. Uh, also, ALUS is uh, ALUS-2 is a Japanese satellite operated at the L-band uh, uh, signal. And it's also uh, available to some users. And uh, in uh, hopefully next year or the year after, uh, NASA would launch its satellites with the help of India, which is called NISAR, which also has an open data policy, which would transform the, the, the way INSAR and SAR is used uh, today with, uh, with, the, with the high quality data and open data policy. Uh, together too with that uh, government owned satellites, also private sector is very active in this domain. So we have plenty of uh, private uh, satellites operated mostly from 2017. So the value of the market at the moment is estimated to be about $5 billion and it's projected to double within the next few years. It shows that radar um, uh, technology and radar remote sensing, it has started its boom and it's just getting growing and uh, it's becoming a major driver of the innovation in the earth science and um, hazard, geohazard monitoring and uh, modeling. So first application of the IMSAR um, uh, for geophysical application probably is this paper, at least made it, uh, this, 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 this map paper made it to the cover of the Nature magazine nearly three decades ago that mapped the, the formation due to the Landers earthquake. And um, how the INSAR works for some of you that may not be as familiar with that, just I have three cartoons showing how INSAR works. So this is Hawaii Islands, this is Mauna Loa, and that's Kilawa, uh, two, uh, two of the most active volcanoes on our planet. Satellite flies over the island and transmit the radar signal, collect the back and create a, create a radar image as you see here. And then satellite goes away and come back sometimes later, transmit the same radar signal and create the second image. So after carefully co-registering second image, the first one, uh, multiplying the first one with the complex conjugate of second one, create a, 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 an image that we call it interferogram. What you see here is the phase change due to mostly surface deformation, uh, elevation of the ground, and also change in uh, properties of the atmosphere during the two acquisition that we call it atmospheric delay. 
We are interested in mostly the formation. So we use uh, existing DEM such as SRT and DEM and subtract this DEM from the interferogram and we create a differential interferogram. What you see here is mostly the formation of the ground, but also it's contaminated with the atmospheric delay, but also some areas you see here, hopefully you can see the, the, my mouse. So there are areas that uh, there is no clear information. Those are the pixels that are of poor quality, whether due to the, you know, it's a water body or this is the uh, forest. Uh, signal is decorrelated and quality degraded. So to, to overcome this limitation, meaning I working only with high quality pixels and reducing those uh, environmental artifacts, the next big thing happened in the community. It's about three, two decades ago. Uh, that was the invention of the time series technique. So time series technique combined a set of images that are acquired over the same area. And by increasing the redundancy in time and space, it would uh, increase the quality or at least precision of the phase that is um, uh, obtained for uh, some of the pixels that are called elite pixels or specifically called apparent scatters or persistent scatters. So in a schematic view, there are two approaches of creating time series. One of them is a small based on subset. And the other category is persistent or permanent scatter. So um, in a small baseline subset or sparse type technique, we don't emphasize any particular image and we create a different combination of this image. So in this figure, every dot, black dot is one uh, SAR image and each red line is one interferogram. So you see that there is no emphasis and there is a, a set of interferogram are created. In contrast, in permanent scatter or persistent scatterers, we have emphasis on one image and we just look at the interferogram that are created with respect to that image. So here, each red line again represents an interferogram. So the, the main difference between the original implementation of the two techniques is that the sparse type technique work with pixels that look like this. It, it, this is the outline of one star pixel and those object in it are the scatterers or surface roughnesses that back a scattered radar signal. So uh, there is a combination of them with no emphasis on any, any particular one. So this kind of pixel gradually decorrelate over the time, and, but they never are as bright or they don't return the signal as strongly as uh, shown into the right, which is the pixel used for the permanent scatter analysis that majority of the pixel cell return signal is dominated by return that comes from one main scatterer or a strong scatterer, which is, could be, for example, the roof of a building. So these pixels have very slow um, degradation of their quality and their phase uh, uh, standard deviation remains low uh, over the time. So there has been lots of work to combine these two techniques. It started from the work of Andy Hooper in 2008, and then 2011, uh, Freddy and others proposed their method called squeeze out and so on. And there has been a few other works. The, the challenge is that really, the, or the question is that we want to extract the most useful information from our interferogram or uh, interferometric data set. So both of those uh, data set, data set used for permanent scatter and those that use for uh, uh, sparse type, which are distributed scatters, are complementary and both of them should be used for um, an analysis. So the work that is done um, following that uh, work of Andy Hooper 2008 and uh, Fritz 2011 was to propose methods to somehow combine the two technique and retrieve the most possible pixels. So most of the approaches proposed up to now are computationally extensive and um, demanding, and um, the result, the quality has to yet to be uh, investigated whether or not it uh, served the purpose. So here we propose a method that um, is fairly straightforward. We use um, concept of uh, a statistical hypothesis testing and um, Voronoi diagram as it's shown here. So, here to the left top, I showed three time series of the phase or phase amplitude for three type of pixel. Permanent scatter is black. Distributed scatter that doesn't have 
uh, large amplitude, but also doesn't have large standard deviation is the red, and a distributed scatter with large scattering is blue. So we want to use the black one and the red one. So, and the idea is how to identify the, 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 the red one uh, from the red and blue category. So black one can be estimated using a parameter that called amplitude dispersion as shown here, which is the um, temporal standard deviation of the amplitude divided by the temporal mean of the amplitude. So those pixels are um, not uh, as uh, frequently uh, available, so they are scarce. And in this schematic view here to the right, the, the, the black circles are the permanent scatters that are identified by examining the, this um, parameter dA, which is basically coefficient of variation for the amplitude of the phase. Um, um, and, um, and then based on this black, circles, we create Voronoi cells. And in each Voronoi cell, we have a set of distributed scatterers, red triangles, and blue uh, squares. So, and then the, the goal is to identify the distributed scatterer that their variance is uh, statistically comparable to the variance of the amplitude of the permanent scatterer. And we show that um, the, the, the ratio of the uh, standard deviation of each pixel to the standard deviation of the permanent scatter for, follow, follows the Fisher distribution. So therefore we create this hypothesis testing. The new hypothesis is that the distributed scatter has the same variance as the permanent scatter. And the alternative hypothesis is that this is not correct, this is not equal. And we test this hypothesis at 0.01 significance level. If the test Past, we keep that pixel, which become a distributed scatterer, which has a standard deviation comparable to that of permanent scattering. And this approach is uh, extremely fast, uh, competitive, and straightforward. And the result, as I'll show you, it's um, a significant improvement over the work that is done uh, so far. So the other issue that we have in uh, um, uh, processing or uh, time series analysis, insert time series analysis, the effect of the atmospheric delay. In particular, the hydrostatic delay and the, of that hydro, the hydrostatic delay, what we concern is the stochastic delay or the one, the component that is random in time, but especially uh, correlate to certain lengths. So it's shown that this kind of atmospheric delay follows a fractal structure and as you see here, this is a power law for several interferograms that have no deformation. And you see that the, the power law or power spectrum of the interferograms are very similar, although they are taken from different area, uh, different time. And it suggests that atmospheric delay has a universal behavior that can be described using uh, uh, fractal uh, structure. But fractals obviously are not easy to create. However, there is a work by Deschamps uh, 1997 that showed fractal signals or fractal structure actually can be uh, approximated using 2D smoothing spline. The 2D smoothing spline has this objective function. You have a function like that. F. Uh, there was a question. I, I heard uh, some background. So F is your uh, function that you want to feed to your data set, which is delta phi. And um, the objective function is to minimize the difference between the two plus the first gradient of the F. So this can be formulated and coded. You can develop a script that fits a function F. In this case, we assume a plane to your data set. And uh, we, we show that this actually this um, 2D smoothing spline fit um, has a characteristic of a fractal like uh, uh, function. And, uh, can identify and remove the atmospheric delay uh, to a good uh, extent. Some uh, examples, some application here from the Southern California. So we used uh, data collected by Sentinel-1A descending imaging, uh, descending orbits over the period of 2014 to 2021. So here you see to the right, uh, the result of the pixel selection. So identifying pixels, uh, using our algorithm. Uh, first panel is the permanent scatter using the, the original approach implemented in 2001 by Freddy. 
The B is the pixel selection using the approach presented by Berardino 2002. C is the distributed scatterers that pass the Fisher test. And D is the combination of the two. We see that there is a lot more pixels. Uh, the white dots are pixels, good pixels, and black are bad, or those that we toss. So we see that there is plenty of pixels. Actually, there is a good, um, there is a large increase in the population of the usable pixel compared to panel A. So then that 2D smoothing spline technique for removing the atmospheric error. So here is an example of the interferogram. This interferogram is um, unwrapped using the uh, minimum cost flow. And the dots, if you can see them, circles that are color-coded are GPS stations that are color-coded to displacement observed during the time spanned by this interferogram. The panel B is the digital elevation model, and you can see there is a good correlation between the two that shows that there is some topographic correlated atmospheric delay in the first one. Panel D and or panel C is also the linear cross correlation between A and B. Panel D is uh, the, the, the interferogram that is corrected using a, a conventional technique that's uh, identifies the linear correlation between uh, interferogram, unwrapped interferogram, and digital elevation model, and remove that. And you can see here, we show the RMS, which is the difference between the phase observed uh, at the location of GPS with that measured at the location of the GPS using the GPS station. So the RMS improved from 1.1 centimeter to 1.5 centimeter. But still, we can identify some areas that there is a remnant of atmospheric uh, delay. And panel E shows the, the interferogram that is corrected using the methods of the 2D smoothing spline. And RMS reduction is about 0.4, which is um, significant, significantly better than the original one, and even better than the conventionally used approach. And panel C shows the semi variogram that shows the variation interferogram that we see the variation decreases significantly if we apply that smoothing spline. And um, I will close the case study by showing the velocity of the uh, time series. So this velocity is the, for two cases. The one case is uh, using the method that we presented here to the left. And B is the standard sparse technique without using the 2D smoothing spline for correcting atmospheric delay. On the left, we obtain a root mean square error, oh, and, and we compare this uh, velocity map with that measured at the location of the GPS stations, which are independently uh, obtained and are not used in processing. So you can see that uh, in the panel C, um, we obtain a very good agreement between uh, GPS displacement and INSAR um, displacement, and the root mean square error is about uh, open. 48 centimeter. The same value for standard spots is about 0.78 centimeter. So it should suggest that the method that we developed has um, some merit and uh, work to a good extent uh, in uh, retrieving uh, surface deformation at high precision and hopefully accuracy. So I'll proceed to the few applications, um, specifically in relative sea level rise and uh, coastal flooding. I think everybody knows that sea level is rising due to change in uh, uh, the, the density of the ocean, warming of the ocean, winds, discharge of the terrestrial water, but also uh, um, melting of the uh, glaciers and so on. But also uh, land elevation is dropping. It's for a number of reasons I would, as I would discuss in the next slide, what matters is really the difference between the two, difference between the, the rate of sea level rise and the rate of the land subsidence, which we call it relative sea level rise. In this slide, I want to um, make the case why that's so important. So there is a study suggests that the frequency of the flooding would double across the US coast if the sea level rises locally by 10 or 20 centimeters. Here I show you the sea level rise at the um, tide gauge, which is installed in Galveston, Texas. So the yellow is the projection of the sea level rise based on the long-term measurement of the tide gauge, assuming only sea level is rising. 
So we see that that 20 centimeter threshold will, will be reached by about 2014. Now we know that that tide gauge is actually subsiding at the rate of about 3.2 millimeter per year. Adding that substance to the rate of sea level rise, the 20 centimeter threshold is reached in 2025. So we have about 10 to 15 years less to prepare for that elevated flooding hazard, which is a significant number when you're planning, uh, when you want to build a resiliency plan and uh, work on the adaptation strategies. So in the next few slides, I would like to briefly explain drivers of the coastal land uh, elevation change. So this is a cross section that goes through the Northern America from the Western part, which is Cascadia to the Eastern part, which is the uh, uh, Atlantic coast. So starting from the left box number one, the main driver of the vertical land motion is the uh, tectonic processes, the subduction of the uh, uh, Pacific plate under the North American plate. As a result of that, we have thickening of the plates, which result into uplift. And uh, this uplift, however, turned into, uh, uh, it will reverse its um, direction during the next major earthquake, we expect about one meter of subsidence happening at some part of the coast during the next uh, major earthquake in the region. The next process in the block or box number two is the compaction of the aquifers due to groundwater uh, extraction or any kind of fluid extraction. So this process is very localized, but the rate is very fast compared to the previous process. And um, it can, um, change at a very short time scale due to the demand and, you know, uh, uh, for example, droughts that drives um, excess pumping. The next process to the box number three is the uh, GIA, glacial isostatic adjustments. That's usually um, uh, slow and steady in time, except in the area that ice mass is uh, lost, like Greenland or Alaska. We expect about, uh, or at least the observation suggests about one centimeter uplift happening in Scandinavia and Northern America. And in the perimeter of that, we expect one to two millimeter per year subsidence. The first process is the compaction of the sediments under their own weights. So specifically in the coastal area of the you know, east coast of the United States, um, sediments are subsiding under their own weight. And this substance rate can be especially valuable and also temporarily variable, depending on the rate of the sediment supply and so on. So in this slide, I summarize different processes that um, uh, might be uh, affecting the vertical land motion. The horizontal axis is the rate of the subsidence, and the vertical axis is the time scale that they would, they would act. So and here for your reference, I show the rate of the uh, sea level rise for the 21st century and its projection under different SSP or RCP scenarios. So we expect if we don't do anything to stop the climate change, we will have a sea level rise at the rate of about centimeter uh, per year by end of 21st century. Anything that is to the right of this red line, which is sediment compaction and, and substance to fluid extraction, surpasses the rate of the sea level rise. And in for management purposes, probably these two factors are more important than the rate of the sea level rise. Anything that is to the, uh, to the, to the left, such as tectonic processes, by that I mean interseismic, not co-seismic, and also GI and SI effects seem to be a slower in the time scale of a century and probably are not as important as uh, the sea level rise. So here we have a challenge. So the challenge is really to measure vertical land motion at the largest scale. By that, I mean hundreds of thousands of kilometers, but it's still at the high resolution, like tens of meters, to make it relevant for the management purposes. But also, we want to have measurements that are in the global reference frame to be compared with the measurement of the sea level rise come from satellites, which are also in the global reference frame. This challenge provides us with opportunity to work uh, to bring two communities together, GNSS and INSAR community. So these two communities also work very often independently, but their product and the data is complementary in many different ways. And um, by putting these two data set together, we can meet those challenges that are impacting us in uh, 21st century 
in an era that climate is changing faster and faster. Some take home lessons. Land subsidence exacerbates the hazard and risk associated with sea level rise. I think this is a fact. Several natural and anthropogenic factors drive land subsidence. Good to know about them. Inside and GNSS combined together, low measuring the com contemporary rate of subsidence at management relevance, uh, uh, resolution, and accuracy. Some case studies, again, from uh, California. In California, uh, coast, uh, as you see here, more familiar than me, all of you probably. We have lots of GPS or GNSS stations and also plenty of INSAR data here. So triangles are uh, GNSS stations, red lines are active faults from USGS and um, squares or rectangles are uh, uh, footprint of ALOS and Sentinel satellite. We can build a uh, a stochastic model to combine um, all these data together. So line of sight measurement from ALOS, Sentinel, we can have many different line of sights, but also can be combined with the measurement of the GNSS stations to estimate 3D displacement field. So this is called unified stochastic model. Some parameters like dx, dy, dz are observed and unknown at the same time. So, to, to make this approach work and quantify the result, we don't use all the GNSS stations. So we, we split our data set, GNSS, into two data set. One data set used to solve uh, this equation, to stabilize this equation. And the second set, which is not used in the calculation, it's kept for the validation, which I'll show you the, the result or validation of the final result with respect to that um, sample that we call it uh, check or uh, validation. So I jump to the result, which is the vertical land motion for the California coast. So you see that there is a, a blue is going down and red is going up. So Southern California is characterized by subsidence at up to rate of this millimeter per year. Central California as well. In the North California, we have uplift, which is associated with the Cascadia subduction zone. We have a similar spot that land is rising, but this looks like that. And those are Santa Ana Cooper system, Santa Clara and Livermore Basin. And we know that due to the water management for, uh, activities and water conservation, actually aquifer are replenished and uh, they are uh, rebound. So, and there is also zone here in the middle that is uplifting. I suspect that's due to some of the faulting processes. I don't have a good uh, answer to that, um, but, um, there are some uh, reverse faults there that may contribute to that uh, uplift. Comparing that with the GNSS measurement that were not used any in, in the analysis, um, we get this result. So each circle, each dot has two value. The, the field value is the GNSS measurement, and the rim is color coded to what it comes from the, this 3D inversion of the insulin and GNSS. So if the color, if you can distinguish the color, like here, it means that insulin GNSS aligned very well. And if they don't, it means that there is a slight difference. And after examining these stations that have difference, we found out that majority of that difference is due to the um, period of the coverage. So for the stations that INSAR and GNSS had the same um, period of observation, we found that the standard deviation of the difference is better than one millimeter per year. So it shows that combination of the INSAR and GNSS can provide us with the measurements that is larger scale, high resolution, and uh, very accurate. Next step is to use this data for some uh, purpose, such as exposure analysis. Here you see uh, communities that are um, uh, provided to us through the census. The latest census at the time was 2010 uh, that we used. So we calculated how many people in each community are affected to the subsidence or exposed to subsidence rate faster than one millimeter per year. Not a surprise the most population or exposed population is in San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco Bay Area. So some take home lessons. So combination of the multi-track INSAR and GNSS data enables measuring vertical land motion at thousands of kilometers, 50 meter resolution, millimeter level, accuracy. So we presented first map of the vertical land motion on the California coast. And 
Again, many highly populated, low elevation coastal communities are affected to the subs uh, are affected by the or exposed to the subsidence. We estimated something about 4.3 to 8.7 million people are likely to be exposed. And the last part is very important. I want to highlight that again. So SAR data are av available globally and publicly available. And uh, technology that is feasible to uh, need to process this data is available, specifically the work that's done in San Diego, which I basically built my work on the work of David Sandwell. Um, it's shown that it's possible to process this data at the global scale and create a very BLM that is relevant at management uh, uh, resolution, tens of meters for the entire world coast where most people live. So going further, using this vertical land motion measurement and uh, estimating future flooding hazard. For most coastal area, we know the projection of the sea level rise. So here's an example of the work published in 2017 for San Francisco Bay Area. This data is updated now in IPCC report. We have um, new projections. Most of them are very similar, but some of them are actually very different than what is published based on RCP. Now they use SSP shared socioeconomic pathways that are use uh, different parameters that, than those used in IPCC uh, four that use RCP uh, scenarios. So land subsidence measurements are contemporary. We, we measure the today or past several years rates. And the question is how to project them forward to make them comparable with what we measure, what we have as a sea level rise projection. So the question is not trivial, and that would be topic of separate uh, talk, but I would just discuss what we did here in Bay Area. So in the Bay Area, majority of the subsidence is due, compact, due to compaction of the sediment. So we created a mechanical model that relates the age of the sediment to their thickness and calculates the rate of the subsidence that you may expect. So the color coded here, each color pixel is color coded to the rate of the compaction depending on the age of the sediment and the thickness. And we found that the Holocene sediments or Holocene Bay mud compaction rate is fairly constant. And the, the, the places that we have the landfills like, such as Foster City or uh, uh, San Francisco International Airport, the rate of the, if you assume a, a steady rate or linear rate, we, we've encountered error of five to 14%, which is negligible compared to other source of error. So therefore, for San Francisco example, we do a linear projection of the land subsidence through 21st century to compare it with the uh, projection of the sea level rise. We compared that, we, we used many different scenarios. I just show you one um, worse example, which is RCP 8.5 that anticipate a, um, upper band for the sea level rise in Bay Area for to be about 140 centimeter by 21st century, end of 21st century. So assuming only sea level rise, we estimated 168 square kilometer of the uh, area is going to be inundated. If we add land subsidence to that, that area would increase to 218 square kilometer, which is a significant increase. Here to the right, I show you that the data color coded, where is uh, red is, uh, uh, the red shows area that's going to be inundated due to the sea level rise and land subsidence, and yellow are those that are going to be inundated only due to the sea level rise. So going to Houston, Texas, we did the same thing there. We combined all the different data set that we had from different satellite and GNSS stations. We combined them with the LIDAR DEMs and projection of the sea level rise. What we did there, we, we also did a storm surge modeling. You know, following the Harvey hurricane 2017, we have a good idea how storms would look like in future. And uh, by doing that modeling, we came up with some scenarios for the storm surge under different uh, warming uh, of the climate. Excuse me. So uh, first I show you the result 
of the area that is going to be inundated, assuming there is no sea level rise. So magically we stop the sea level rise and there is no hurricane or storm, still something about 76 square kilometer of the land is going to be uh, inundated in the area due to the substance rates uh, that is mostly associated, associated to compaction of the sediment, but also residual compaction of the aquifers in the region. If you include the effect of the sea level rise by through uh, uh, scenario RCP 8.5 and also adding eight meter of a storm surge comparing uh, compared to the storm surge during the Harvey uh, hurricane 2017, we estimate that area of 1,156 square kilometers is going to be inundated, which is significant piece of land and property will be exposed to that hazard. So. Some take home lessons, even without any future sea level rise, flooding hazard may increase due to continued coastal land substance. So in San Francisco Bay, uh, an area of 125 to 429 square kilometer will be subject to inundation due to sea level rise and land subsidence. In Houston Bay area, that number is 186 square kilometer to 100, 1,157 square kilometer considering different sea level rise, land subsidence and storm surge scenarios. So a little bit, I close my presentation with some of uh, the results from the ongoing project, which is a uh, collaboration between uh, USGS and Virginia Tech. So it, this, the title of project is Future Coastal Hazard in the Southeast, a coastal change hazards template for uh, national expansion. So the idea of this project is to, to use the best uh, science and knowledge that we have about coastal processes, whether it's subsidence or erosion, and combine it with the physics-based model of the sea level rise and also projection of the coastal land substance to create new hazard, flooding hazard map for the entire coast of the United States. So we completed the work that is done on the east coast of the United States. It's uh, about 3,000 kilometers covered by about 16 uh, frame of the Sentinel L uh, C band satellite and 96, 95 ALUS frame. We have about 460 GNSS stations. And to the right, you see the distribution of the pixels um, that are used uh, for this analysis. The red are the Elliot pixels selected from ALUS, and blue are those from Sentinel. And I just show you the result. So the left is the horizontal motion in X direction. Middle one is the Y direction and the, to the right is the vertical or VZ. And each circle here shows the GNSS station color coded to the rate, which is independent from the what comes from the inside. So the comparison uh, result between this, this independent GNSS measurement and that comes from inside is shown in this histogram. So for DX, we have a standard deviation, which is about uh, 0.2 millimeter per year of the difference. For the DY, we have 0.2 as well. And for DZ is about 1.2 millimeter per year. And we see most of the coast is subsiding. And the fastest rate is observed in Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, that's, that's, that's you see here, I'm highlighting. The rate is about six millimeter per year, but also in um, um, Georgia and South Carolina coast, we have also fast rate of the substance. We can compare this measurement with the observation of the land cover that's provided by USGS in 2016. We see that majority of the land substance happened at the wetlands, developed area of forest and croplands of uh, rate is about two millimeter, two to four millimeter per year. If you look at some um, sites of the dense, densely popula dense population, such as New York, you see that large part of the developed area are subsiding at a rate of uh, uh, two to up to two millimeter per year. This could be due to the weight of the building, but also there is a, a general GIA effect that impacting all this region regardless of the uh, surface or land cover. Okay, moving uh, further south to Chesapeake Bay, we see that large part of the Chesapeake Bay is also subsiding, specifically wetlands, crop, um, uh, 
agriculture land and also forest. Most of the substance here is due to the pumping of the groundwater. At least that's uh, 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 taught until now. And going further south to the uh, Georgia and uh, North South Carolina, we see that the majority of the substance happen where we have these wetlands. And this is a very important you know, point. So the substance of the wetland means that wetlands are lost due to erosion and also they are inundated, but also wetlands are uh, sequestering a large volume of the CO2. Lo losing that um, wetland may result into um, acceleration of the re release of the CO2, which uh, may uh, you know, accelerate the rate of the, the, the warming of the climate, which would accelerate the sea sea rate of the sea level rise. So it's a sort of compound or cascading hazard, if you will, which would be interesting and it would be subject of a future work to investigate. But thank you so much for your attention. I would be happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shia for the wonderful talk. And uh, so now we are open for questions. I'll ask a question. This is Dave Sandwell. Um, first of all, very interesting results and uh, yeah, good work. If you need to have the GNSS data to make the INSAR data into a vector measurement. Um, and looking at all your maps, is, would it be really, would it be useful to add GNSS sites in particular areas? Could you recommend that place, places be added to help you out in this vertical measurement? So the, the, the biggest challenge we have at the moment is, uh, you know, the more GNSS station we have, the better it is. The problem that we have is not the distribution of GNSS station, it's the way they are installed. So I went to actually check some of the GNSS stations in the Savannah area. So they are an anchored to the ground, but they are they anchored to depths of several meters. So basically the poker hole and GNSS station, sometimes the, the pillar is six to eight meters deep. But most of the substance that we see with insert actually happens in the top few um, tens of centimeter to a meter or two. Mm. So there is a disconnect between what insert measures and what GNSS measures. So that's for that reason, we had to leave out actually plenty of those GNSS stations as their value was not consistent with what, for example, geologists from USGS installed an instrument called RSET. This is a very rudimentary tool. It's basically two bars and one, one side sits on the ground and sink with the land. And the, the rate they measured for, for subsidence of a compaction of the wetlands or marshes was several order of magnitude faster than what GNSS measures. Huh. I think that's the bigger challenge at the moment that we have to address. Huh. Interesting, thanks. Okay. Uh, Adrian? Mano, thank you for coming to visit and for that fast, fascinating talk. And you're just doing so many different things these days. Um, <laughs> I had a, a specific question about the California, um, I guess it was the Coastal Vertical Land Motion Study where you combine the INSAR and the GPS, the GNSS. And I was curious uh, whether you were regularizing that inversion where you were uh, doing the line of sight using both measurements. No, we don't use any kind of regularization in it, but uh, the GPS stations, GPS measurements are interpolated over the INSAR pixels. So, and once we interpolate them, we have to also interpolate their standard deviation. And we, uh, we apply a inverse, um, we downweight G value, interpolated GNSS value as a function of distance. So the further you go from the GNSS station, the lower is the value of the um, GNSS interpolated value. So that's the only parameter we have. Otherwise, we do not apply any smoothing in it. Ah, uh, so the, the GPS then is being applied to every pixel in some way. Okay, got Exactly. It. Thank yes. you, understood. Well, thank you so much for the talk. Oh. Uh, so there's another question in the chat window. 
Oh, I did not see that. Okay, has the prediction that the Arctic Ocean will be ice-free in the summer 20 been considered? No, we, we have not considered that. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing, or it's a, a work that we are uh, undertaking right now. It was not included in our uh, projection scenarios that we used until 2021. Uh, I ask a question about that. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm concerned uh, with what's called the Arctic amplification. And that's a continuing aspect of, of course, the albedo and the loss of ice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's why I popped this question on there, uh, whether or not you have looked at that aspect of uh, the sea level rise as a result. No, unfortunately, I have not. Okay. <laughs> It's, I, I'm very impressed with what you're doing now. So in, in, incredible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, John, please. Hi, uh, I have a question about what's happening in estuaries. Um, you know, when the water covers up the land, you know, there's also sedimentation taking place. Yes. So, so what role does sedimentation, enhanced sedimentation, play in offsetting you know, the subsidence and things like that? Uh, th that's a very good question. So uh, there is a misconception, I think. I, it was my own misconception till a year ago. So when, when you have, uh, say, added sedimentation, okay, I always thought land should rise. But in, in fact, very often when sediment added at the beginning due to its weight, substance rate accelerates. So for a, oh. for a period of time, substance rate due to the weight of new sediment is faster than actually um, the, uh, the elevation gain to do the, due to the added sediment. After a while, the co sub, sub compaction rate slows down and then elevation gain began actually to offset that substance and land rises. So it's a very interesting, fascinating process that I did not know till a year ago. And I observed that. So, I don't okay. know. There are models that account for that, but the process seems to be very complex. Very interesting. So, what kind of measurements kind of quantify that? Uh, I, I, as I said, I, I had the pleasure to to join a field trip by some of the USGS colleague and also colleague in Tulane, uh, Tor Torbjorn, and they have an instrument that it's literally, they call it R-SET. I can't remember, it stands for what? R-S-E-T. If you Google it, probably you can find it. And it's, it's very simple. It has two bars. One long bar goes into the ground and second bar sit just on top of the marshes. And then sediments will be added to that and then it subsides. So they know the thickness of the sediment on top of that marker. And also they know how much land below that marker compacted. Interesting. Yeah, I imagine with, you know, at, at low tide, you can get the sediments exposed and then you get a little look at it. So, thank you very much. Uh, Kenzo. All right. Thank you, Manu. That's a really interesting talk. Um, I'm, I have a question about the algorithm to remove the atmospheric uh, interference. So you said you fit a spline to your on route phase. And in that process, do you worry about removing the signals generated by you know, land deformation? Right. Yes, that's a good question. You should be worried. For that reason, the, the correction is not applied. Uh, to estimate the correction, you have to identify very short temporal baseline interferograms. And you calculate, you know, if you have n images, for example, you identify n minus one interferogram that has the shortest temporal baseline, because atmospheric error is independent from the temporal baseline, while the deformation is, deformation or signal can correlate with that. You calculate the cor correction only for that n minus one interferogram, and then based on that, you correct every other interferogram. So in this way, you minimize the, the, the possibility of removing signal. And I tested that at many different settings, such as you know, Mexico City, that rate of subsidence is about 40 centimeters to 35 centimeters. 
to the, and also attested that in uh, Southern California, that the rate of deformation is at the order of millimeter. In both cases, there was almost a negligible, if not zero correlation between corrected atmosphere and, and uh, the signal uh, that was, I was interested in. So you are based on the assumption that the deformation signals are, <clears throat> you know, they have very different temporal variation scale from the atmospheric signals, but they, but they can potentially have similar spatial variation uh, the, um, pattern. The spatial variation does not really matter in this case, because when we create that uh, 2D smoothing spline, we make sure that the spatial correlation is less than 2.5 kilometers. So uh, I have to say, it, it, there, there will be occasion that we remove some of the signal. But based on the test that I did, and I'm not exaggerating, I think I tested 40 different sites or zero with different um, characteristics. In none of them, I identified any, uh, any signal that was mapped into artifact, given the range of error, so uncertainty that we expected. But to be fair, it's possible that happens. I did not encounter that yet. All right, thank you so much. Yuri? Hi, Manu. Um, Hi, Yuri. If you compare your uh, vertical velocity field uh, from the interpolation of GPS to your combined velocity field, how different would they be? I'm wondering how much does INSER contribute at these wavelengths of 100 kilometers? Uh, can you repeat the question? You broke up. OK. If you take your uh, vertical velocity field and compare the interpolation from GPS only to the combined product, uh, how different would those be? Right. So I have done that for both sides in uh, California, and I compared that actually with Adrian's work that they published also. Um, the long wavelengths deformation, more than 50 to 80% come from GPS, not from inside. So literally, they, they, the two are very complementary, I would say. The long wavelengths is mostly uh, GPS and the shorter wavelengths, anything less than 100 or 50 kilometer was from uh, mostly, majority was from inside. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, I think Jenna has a question in the chat box. Thank you for the good talk. Did you eliminate the effect of seismicity when constructing INSAR along coastal area or are they also, uh, what is this um, effect of seismicity? Like uh, earthquakes, you mean? Yeah, I think earthquakes can generate some signal like subsidence or uplift. So are you considering that too? So, what you, what you see in the map is everything that can be measured. So that includes also seismic effect or tectonic signal, if you will. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hello. Sorry, I just forgot to lower my, oh, okay. lower my hand. Sorry about that. I would now do that. Sorry. Okay. So uh, if there's no more questions. Let's uh, thank Dr. Sherzai again for this uh, wonderful seminar. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And uh, so next week we will have uh, uh, one Hui Lai from Australian uh, National University to give us the seminar and uh, it will be hosted by Alan. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sherzai for joining us today. And Thank you so much for the opportunity. I look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you, Manu. Take yeah. care. Thanks, Manu. It's too bad you couldn't travel out here. We'd like to I, see you. I, I, I so much look forward. I'm, I'm jealous. You guys are having such a great <laughs> <laughs> Soon, I'll, I will do that, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. See you. <laughs>